What's up? What's up, man? What's going on, How's Mason? It going? It's going good. Things How are you? Oh, man, things are fantastic. I love how we're just talking over each other. It's so great. I love it. Oh, yeah. Great, uh, great, uh, great chemistry here. I'm just trying to yeah. talk at the same time. All it's right. Good to so, be back. Uh, yeah, welcome back. Uh, got that uh, got that assemblage merch on, under the uh, Hawaiian shirt, I see. Oh, yeah. You got you know, you to wrap it when you can. Hell, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm going... No, no merch underneath today, but uh, <laughs> next week I'll, I'm going to be rocking the merch all day today. I'm off uh, after this. Nice. So got to go run some that. errands and uh, rep the brand. So, um, but yeah, welcome back to um, the Assemblage Beverage Podcast. Um, this podcast is called Wherever the Boys, Where the Boys Go, the Drinks Flow. Um, and this is all about location and kind of the drinks that we love enjoying at, you know, certain specific locations. And, uh, you know, hopefully if you're looking for your new beverage, wherever we're talking about, hopefully we can help you out. And, um, you know, we'd love to kind of hear in the comments, you know, whether you're listening on YouTube or Spotify or anywhere you're, you're listening to this podcast, kind of give us your favorites, uh, at, you know, these specific locations. Um, before we get into kind of that location and, and drinks and things like that, I kind of want to touch on, uh, you know, these these beautiful Hawaiian shirts that we have. Um, if you've noticed, they are matching to the skeleton guy, um, our, our logo. Um, yep. And um, the, the Hawaiian shirts are kind of an homage to our time at the CIA. Um, we would always wear Hawaiian shirts every Friday um, when we were in associates. Hawaiian shirt Friday. Hawaiian shirt Friday. Um, and we would always wear them during associates. We'd always wear them um, after class because we were always in chef lights. And then in bachelors, we would always wear them to class because they were technically business casual. And, and tucked uh, in. And tucked during in. Class. <laughs> nothing, nothing more soigné than a tucked in Hawaiian shirt and old dress pants or slacks. It's just, it's the move. Uh. Um, but, uh, you know, so we're kind of, when, when we were rebranding the company, um, <laughs> <it's just good. laughs> um, our dogs, you know, what can you do? Yeah. This Life's is punishing this, them. This is the realest podcast ever. You know, we got, we got, I'll probably have construction guys walking through in a minute, got dogs going crazy. Um, but that's all right. Um, we're, we're pretty, we try to be real. So. Um, just as real as it gets, you know, we don't have no fancy recording studio or anything like that, but not yet. Uh, not yet. <laughs> um, we need more listeners for that first, but, uh, but yeah, so when we were rebranding the company, I really wanted, um, it to be more, uh, genuine to who Mason and I are and we're Hawaiian shirt wearing dudes. And, uh, so, you know, the, the design on the Hawaiian shirt as obviously grapes is kind of, you know, where the roots of the companies, it was a, a, a wine or a wine company or a wine um, consulting company. Now it's more beverage based. So all beverages. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to, you know, kind of do a, a fun shirt. Um, that was also kind of true to who we are. So, um, I meant to bring that up in the first podcast together, but, um, I, it got lost in, uh, the excitement of the first podcast. So um, we had too much fun. It, too you know, fun. it is what it is. Yeah. But the, the shirt looks great on you. The merch looks great on you. So uh, Same with you, Chef. Thanks, Chef. Um, cool. You want to just jump into uh, our first location, what we like to drink there? Yeah. Cool. So first location I believe we chose was the beach. Um, and I don't know about you, but when I go to the beach, I'm more of a light cocktail kind of drinker um, or a light wine kind of drinker if I'm going to drink wine. Mm -hmm. um, I think my favorite, top few favorites – um, are mojitos, pina coladas, frozen related drinks, and probably like tequila sodas. Nice. Yeah, I, then, I agree with the, the pina colada and the frozen drinks. I mean, like, I'm not a huge frozen drink guy as far as, like, day-to-day, -day, but I think, like, hot beach, hot sun, refreshing frozen drink with booze in it. I mean, yeah. can't what can you beat that. No. Nah. Yeah. I think uh, the Pina Colada classic Coco Lopez style um, blended is the best mm -hmm. way to go. Um, you know, ice, rum, tequila, whatever you're feeling, and then the Pina Colada itself, 
uh, the Coco Lopez. Uh, it's just super delicious. You know, uh, I don't know if you've had one yourself in the recent past, uh, in the recent future past, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but on the honeymoon, that was like my go-to drink the whole time, which was awesome. Um, and then I don't know if you want to switch into beer at all, but like Corona or something like that with lime, mm -hmm. easy peasy drinking right there. Yeah. And I, I actually just, um, on our summer cocktail menu at the, at the restaurant I work at, we had a, a pina colada on the menu, but it was a clarified pina colada. Oh, that's um, interesting. Yeah, so it's it's a, a style of beverage called milk punch. Um, essentially, what you do is you take, um, you know, you can basically do it with any type of acidic cocktail. Um, and by that, like alcohol has acid in it. So um, <clears throat> so essentially, you take, uh, in this case, it was white rum. I took pineapple juice. I took a little bit of uh, lemon juice, uh, Coco Lopez, which for those of you who don't know what Coco Lopez is, it's essentially like a canned coconut cream. Um, it's like super thick and super sweet and delicious. Um, and then you essentially mix those together, pour it into milk. Uh, the milk, it's kind of, it looks really disgusting. Um, it, the, the alcohol and, and the acid from the juices kind of curdle the milk. And then you essentially strain that mixture through like cheesecloth or through a coffee filter and through that, those curds, and it essentially will clarify um, the, the cocktail. So you're left with, um, you know, Basically, it's like a, a, a light tan or a light yellow color, um, but you get the essence of a pina colada. So it's kind of a cool way to pack a lot of flavor and then get rid of all the color. Um, and you're left with, you know, just serve it over a big rock. Um, you know, that's perfectly clear as well. And uh, uh oh, dogs are dogs are ready for the pina colada, man. Uh, oh, yeah. They're ready to go to the beach and hang out. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so so I'm you know totally on board with a pina colada. Obviously, the clarified one is uh, a lot for the beach. It's probably easier to just throw all the shit in a blender and blend it up and uh, with some ice. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm a big beer guy on the beach. Um, you know, for me, like Pacifico, um, it's kind of where I go if I'm going to go like Mexican lagers or tecate. Um, I'm not a big lime and beer kind of guy personally. Um, Why is that? I don't know. I'm, I'm just, I like, like just beer flavor. The beer. Yeah. I, get like, that. I, I love lime and I love acid, but for some reason, like in beer, it's just not my, it's not my jam. Um, uh, but I, got you. I'm, I feel like I'm the minority in that situation because like everyone's got wine and beers, especially like at Mexican restaurants or at the beach, like throw a lime in there. Um, yeah. splash of citrus kind of brightens it up. Yeah. See, I'm, Nah. Not, not a, not a citrus and beer guy, but that's all right. I, that's all right. Everybody's out their own. Yeah. But yeah, I, I really like beer, especially it's just super easy, you know, just crack open a cold one. Um, uh, that is the one time I'll drink high life out of a can because you know, a lot of time on the beach, you can't have glass. Uh, um, it's just easier to carry it around, get the koozie going. Yeah, you know, you get the, the 16 or 20 ounce cans and you've got a lot more, a lot more. You can uh, crush them real quick. Mm -hmm. yeah. Easy cleanup, easy cleanup, easy recycling. So, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, tequila drinks, frozen pina coladas, beer. That's kind of where I'm at on the beach. Um, <clears throat> you want to, you want to move into, uh, kind of the, not, you know, I guess the opposite of the beach, uh, mountains, uh, yeah. I'm not, mountains. Not a big mountain guy, so I'll I'll leave this to you because I know you spent a lot of time, you know, in in the mountains and snowboarding and skiing and, and you know doing all those fun snow sports. I'm not a I'm not a snow sports guy, so uh, I'm not a big snow mountains. sports guy. But you know, you know, balancing it out a little bit here, a little bit there. I'm working on my snowboarding skills. Uh, I last time I went snowboarding about four or five years ago now. Uh, finally got carving down, went with my fiance or girlfriend at the time, now wife. Whoa. Smacking the mic around everybody. Uh, but, uh, we literally were on the bunny hill for like our first run, maybe halfway down. She falls, hurts her wrist so hard that that was it. We were done for the whole day. No, it's over. Haven't been back since, but that's okay. Uh, so back on to the drinks, uh, you know, Cold drinks that are um, 
warming to the body, like straight up, straight bourbon, um, extra Anejo tequilas, things that really feel like you warm up your whole body is like my kind of normal drinks that I have. Um, but if I'm wanting to have something a little bit warmer, um, hot cocktail styles, you know, you have the hot toddy, uh, hot chocolates that are spiked. Mm. Uh, you can do eggnog, which we're getting to the holiday season now where that's going to start becoming a big thing. Um, my uh, OG restaurant from New York City, Gramercy, uh, they had one of the best eggnog mixtures I've ever had. Miro um who was the um, pastry head pastry chef there. He was the one who designed it. And I believe they actually have it either up on um, their Instagram or something like that, or um, you can always reach out to them and get it. But um, whatever he put in that specifically, cause he put like 12 different ingredients in it was just out of this world. And of those 12 ingredients, I think half of them were all spirits. <laughs> so they're like, they crushed it. All you had to do is, heat up and it was delicious but uh hot chocolate martini i don't know if you've had one of those uh yeah simple easy you know get milk uh chocolate mixture um my recommendation today um is using like a simple syrup like um 1883 uh, or 1886 um it's just like a simple syrup, chocolate syrup, mixing that with the milk, heating it, and then adding a splash of um, either like Bailey's, Kahlua, uh, rum chata, um, you know, all those, yeah, you know, whatever you're kind of feeling kind of makes it, makes it really delicious. And then the hot toddy, uh, I think is, you know, a great way to get over your sickness as well if you're not feeling so great. Um, literally like bourbon, lemon juice, orange juice, and hot water, just all mixed together, a little bit of honey. Super easy and just warms you up and makes you feel better. It feels like you're drinking tea with a little bit of spike to it. Yeah, I, I love that. I mean, <clears throat> for me, I'm not like a snow sports guy at all. Like I would probably go skiing or snowboarding once. And I feel bad because like my fiance and my fiance's family, like, Europe. like they go they went skiing all the time they haven't gone in a couple of years but and i'm it like happens. i'm like yeah it, I, I don't really like being cold and i'm also like not super athletic i mean i i can do like sports like you know basketball i'm okay at golf i'm okay at, but like i i have a feeling like me going down a mountain on a board i don't have very good balance so i feel like it would just end up really badly for me so like I feel like if we were to go on like a ski trip or a snowboarding trip, I would be like a big ski lodge kind of guy, you know, just hey, like snow bunnies are important. Yeah. You know, I would be the biggest snow bunny ever. I would, you know, just like sitting there, uh, you know, sipping hot chocolate or, you know, I'm a big fan of like coffee with either Bailey's or rum chata in it, you know, especially like just kind of not a whole lot, but it kind of gives you like a, a different flavored coffee and, you know, like booze makes everything better. So, um, you know, I think, I think those are, would be my, you know, two things. Eggnog. I, I haven't had eggnog since college, uh, cause I did an eggnog chugging competition in college and, uh, it was the <laughs> I don't fastest, I don't, I don't know that, I mean, you would have been at the campus, but I, I don't know why we weren't together, but it was in the egg and, um, it was the fastest to, I think, I feel like it was like holiday bingo or something. And like, they ended up, you know, they're like, okay, we we're going to take a break from bingo. Who wants to be in this eggnog trucking competition? And it was the first to drink a quart of, um, like Dean's eggnog. Um, and I didn't win, but I then proceeded to finish the eggnog after the competition was over. And I, I think that's the last time I drank eggnog. Cause like drinking a quart of eggnog in like under five minutes is a lot. Uh, I mean, Heavy. it's a lot of, it's a lot of liquid and then you're essentially like eggnog is basically melted ice cream. Um, I mean, what is like, they ready to describe it? It's, it's like ice cream base. Um, and it's like just thick and like, yeah. So, um, and I, I, I'm really not like the biggest, um, hot cocktail person either. Um, I've, I've tried, but to me, sometimes they drink too hot. Um, 
because you obviously have um, like the heat of the cocktail itself, but then you also have the heat of the alcohol. Um, yeah. and, and if it's not in balance, um, you know, like, it goes right to your head. It goes right to your head. And it's also like really like that burning sensation is also uh, can be a lot. But, um, you know, I'll, I, I'll mess with like a hot sangria um, or something like that. Um, try that. Hot sangria is nice because uh, you're essentially just warming or like mold wine. I would consider like hot sangria and mold wine to be similar. Um, you know, I think that's kind of where I'll kind of stop just because you're essentially only heating up wine. So your your alcohol level is going to be lower than, say, you know, like a hot toddy or you know something along that line. Um, but I'll I'll. I'm going to stick on the mountains or uh, to like a hot chocolate or a, or a coffee with, with rum chata or, or Bailey's in it. That's kind of where I'm going. Um, Mr. Snow Bunny, ready for it. Mr. Snow Bunny, I'm ready for it. <laughs> um, cool. You want to jump into to what we're drinking at restaurants? And I, I think yeah. restaurants is such like a wide range because um, you know, obviously. There's like, so many different types. There's so many different types and, you know, you're not going to like what you're going to drink at a fast casual versus a brew pub versus a fine dining restaurant versus a cocktail bar is going to be completely different. Um, you want to kind of talk about, um, like what you drink at like a brew pub. I mean, I, I feel like it's pretty obvious, but you know, I don't, I don't know. You've got some, some idea here and I, uh, I'm, I'm interested to hear about it cause I'm not sure what, what one of these things is on our list. Yeah. So brew pub, um, I think my favorite beers to go to, um, Probably standard is almost always an IPA. That kind of hoppiness, bitterness is something I really enjoy. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe that goes along with um, liking the more bourbons and the darker spirits. Um, but I just, you know, I like to almost taste what what I'm drinking. And maybe that's why, like, those lighter beers are saved just for the beach and whatnot. Because, you know, easy drinking versus complex and have a lot of flavors to it you know there's so many different styles of brewing and i'm not an expert in brewing that's like my least looked at information Mm -hmm. for me i'm working on that you know i've considered doing the cicerone at one point but never actually dove into that that's the beer related um education for those who don't know um and um i just you know i you have to, again, dedicate time, which is something I didn't really want to do. I just enjoyed drinking it very much. So. Yeah, and that's me. I have my, like, level one Cicerone, which is uh, Dang, look like at that beer server or beer pour. I forget what they call it. Um, but to me, like, when, I'm, when, I'm, when I was studying the beer, beer to me is more of my, like, enjoying thing. You know, it's, it's a beverage that I don't really want to like have to think a whole lot about. Um, and I, I feel bad saying that, but it's always been like my relaxation drink. Um, and, and studying beer and like different beer styles to me is way harder than studying wine. Um, like the Cicerone, like level one Cicerone, I was like, holy shit. Cause there's so many different styles of beer, um, you know, different types of fermentation. Uh, it, and it, it's no I mean, it's different than wine, but it's it's kind of similar in, in the styles. Like, you know, I consider the styles kind of like the grapes, um, you know, or whatever hops they're using. Um, but to me, like, Cicerone was really difficult. Um, yeah. You know, way more difficult than wine. But again, I think it's just because wine's always been, like, my primary focus as far as the beverage world goes. And beer's always been my, like, okay, I'm done studying wine. I'm going to go drink a beer now. Uh, right. So, yeah. And, you know, we're, you got to dedicate a lot of time. Right. Exactly. So uh, it's something I want to dive into more, but I'm also kind of cool with it just being like my, my fun beverage, you know, my, like my just chilling. Uh, yeah. And when I go to brew pubs, you know, I'm you know, IPAs, you know, I always try and uh, try their, like whatever their house IPA is. Um, or if there's some sort of interesting style of IPA that I, that I haven't heard of or a hop that I've never tried before, I'd always try and go for those. But I also like trying their lagers, too, because lagers are actually, like, they take a long time to make. Um, even though they're, like, a simplistic style of beer and they're light, crisp, refreshing, the, the fermentation time is way longer than, like, an IPA would be. So um, I always try their, their lagers just because I, I think 
if they can do a lager well, they're probably going to do everything else well. Um, and again, yeah. that just goes back to my preference in, in drinking lighter styles of beer. So, um, cause for me, if I drink light beer, I can drink more beer and that, uh, that makes me happy. So, um, you know, and also like brew pubs, they've been really stepping up their food too. Um, yeah. The last couple it's been kind of crazy. Too, I'm like, man, their food is like, it's like chef driven food. Um, I'll, I'll touch on it a little bit later, but there's a local brewery, um, here in, um, Atlanta called New Realm. And we went there, I was like a work trip and, uh, I was like, man, their beer is delicious, but their food is like, I think the food was almost better than the beer. Like it was really freaking good. That's awesome. It was like new American and like a, a lot of Italian influences, but then they also had a lot of like Asian influence too. So it's kind of a cool, uh, like mashup menu. Um, but we'll, let's move on to more like the fine dining sphere of things. Um, cause you know, you're probably not going to get, well, like, I, like I, yeah, I typically wouldn't get like a beer at a fine dining restaurant. I mean, maybe, but, um, well, it's, uh, I, I think to me, fine dining screams a lot more like maybe a nice cocktail to start, uh, whatever kind of, if they've got like a, a seasonal cocktail menu or signature cocktail list, maybe start out with a cocktail. Um, and then I'm always diving into their wine list. Um, you know, yeah. they have. Alex and I do that too. And, and I think the cocktail is like a good way to kind of like break the ice and make you relax a little bit because going to some fine dining restaurants can be like actually pretty stressful. Uh, you know, you, you, well, you've got to like dress up. Uh, you've got to like, you, you, you know, a, to a certain point, you have to act a certain way. You've got to, oh, high society, you know, uh, <laughs> you can't just like show up. I mean, you can, I guess, but like whenever I'm going out to a nice meal, like I try and dress the part and I try and dress up a little bit. Um, right. So, you know, that cocktail kind of gets you back to like grounded. Um, and then diving into the wine list. Um, I'm a huge tasting menu kind of guy. Um, I love doing tasting menus and wine pairings because it's a good way for me to kind of still like enjoy wine and think about it, but not having the pressure to make a, a wine selection that's going to pair with the whole menu. Um, you know, like if you get a bottle, like a bottles, you know, if you're sharing it with one other person, it's two and a half glasses a person, um, you know, and, and that can, that can be like your wine for the evening. Whereas if you're doing a, a tasting menu, you know, they're going to pick two or three ounce pours to pair with each course. And then you can kind of enjoy a lot of different styles of wine, as well as kind of, um, you know, fully envision what the sommelier and what the chef have worked so hard on creating. Um, you know, if, if tasting menus, not the, you know, style of fine dining, personally, I'm going with, um, a wine that I know will pair with a lot of different dishes. Maybe it won't be able to hit every single dish, um, because you're always going to have, you know, um, maybe some sort of like fish or, you know, maybe you'll progress into a, a heavy meat dish there's not really many styles of wine that'll pair with both fish, like a very delicate, maybe a crudo, and then pair with like short ribs, not many styles. Um, uh, so yeah. I'll typically like, if I'm, if I'm going to commit to a bottle, I'll typically commit to like a bottle of champagne, uh, because champagne can't go wrong with like, that. You can't go wrong with it. It's all encompassing. It'll pair with pretty much everything. Um, you know, maybe I'll go with like, Burgundy or Pinot Noir. Um, it, you know, my budget's not Burgundy. Maybe I'll go like Oregon Pinot because I, I don't know how many people's actual budget is Burgundy because it's yeah. so yeah. expensive. It's, you know, starts normally like $200 and that's like the bottom level. And you're yeah. like, what the heck? Yeah. So, uh, I'll, so or like an Oregon Pinot because those are um, very, they're similar in style to Burgundy with like kind of a, the freshness and the earthiness to it, um, you know, and, and it's like half the price. Um, obviously, the subtle nuances of Burgundy are always going to be their own thing, but I think Oregon Pinots are a good kind of substitute to to those. So typically, that's where I'll go, and I'm a huge um, sweet wine drinker too. Like, and Me by too. sweet wine, I mean dessert wine. Um, so I'll always try and finish with a sauterne or a port or an ice wine, um, kind of depending on what their, you know, dessert selections are. Um, like if they've got a vintage, uh, sauterne, I'm always going for it. 
Um, so that's kind of where I'm at um, in fine dining. What about you? Yeah. Um, it's very interesting that uh, you prefer to do the pairings with a uh, tasting menu. Um, Alex and I almost always do a bottle. Um, mm -hmm. We're under that concept that, you know, there is a bottle that will pair with the majority of the meal and agree with not everything on the meal. Normally the first, uh, depending on how many courses, of course, the first one or two courses of a meal, you can't get the wine to pair all the way through. But after that, you can get something that'll match everything else right. um, or get you something that'll most of the way. Um, so we normally start with the cocktail as well. Um, of course, I'm almost always the Boulevardier mm -hmm. classic. Uh, but, um, you know, I'm anytime I go to any restaurant um, that is known for cocktails or wine, um, I look specifically at their cocktail menu that they have curated. Um, because they've chosen a few different selections that have their own types of infusions, uh, their own um, styles of, or twists on classic cocktails to make things delicious. And I'll look through it and, stuff, if anything, on a specific drink um, catches my eye, I'm ordering it, period. Like, no need to try anything else. Um, so for me, going through the, the, the uh, cocktail menu... I always go with the spirit preference and I'll look at those cocktails specifically. Never look at the names. I, you know, names kind of just throw you off for me. And I just look at first the spirit, the main spirit ingredient. If that is the spirit I want, then I look at all the other ingredients and I go, that's interesting. Let's try it. Like the other day, there was just one with um, Earl Grey infused bourbon. I was like, all right, let's try that. That sounds interesting. And, you know, ended up being a martini style cocktail and almost like a Manhattan Earl Grey. And it was delicious. Fantastic. Cool. Um, then, when uh, you know, we normally order the meal. If we're doing the tasting menu, um, we do the cocktail for the first or two set or the first or the first two uh, courses. And then Alex normally picks out the wine for us because, you know, she's that song dedicated for us. And I always love um, her taste in wine. Um, normally we go back going white red. Then after we decide the color that we want, we'll, we'll start digging into what grape we want. Um, if we're doing white grapes, normally Shannon and Riesling are the top two that I always want. It's my favorite, mm -hmm. classic, light, refreshing. Um, champagne is always a option on the board. That's its own separate category, of course. And then if we're doing red wine, most of the time it's a lighter red. Um, Pinot Noir, Gamay, um, sometimes even even though it's not a light red, but can taste a little bit lighter, is like some Syrahs and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and that Syrah can kind of pair with some of the heavier dishes near the end of a tasting menu. Um, trying to find something that kind of matches each one. Um, and since I'm lucky to have my wife be a song, I don't ever have to ask for the song. Um, but we always like chatting with them because you never know what kind of insight they have. Plus, it's their own menu that they've curated or they've helped curate. And so they'll have a good insight onto certain bottles that you may not remember the label for or something like that. And just give you a little bit of tidbits that kind of pull you into certain wines and whatnot. Yeah, no, and that's kind of how we go about it. Yeah, and I think that's a great thing, you know, especially like I typically like you know same thing when when Liv and i go out for dinner like I, I i don't typically ask for the song um or if i do it's it's really just to have a conversation talk wine shoot the shit because at the yeah. end of the day like that's Very what the song is there for um they're there yeah. to kind of help you with wine and, and a lot of times if you're if you're nice to the sommelier you know if you kind of talk wine with them and they kind of get a feel for who you are um, they might say, Hey, I've got this thing that I just got in. Um, you know, it's not even it's not on the menu. menu. I'll cut you a deal you like or, you know, Hey, would you like to try yeah. a glass? And that is a great way to kind of like get into their good graces. And it's, it's, you don't have to be like obnoxious or like, where's your sommelier? You know, it could just be like, Hey, you like, you guys got a sommelier. Like I'd love to chat wine with them. Um, cause when I'm on the floor in the restaurant, like that's the thing I look forward to is like having those, those real wine conversations, um, with people. I love helping people who don't know what they're talking about either. Um, yeah. but having conversations with people who do know wine, 
um, or are in the industry. Like I, I love those conversations and I'm sure other people love those conversations too. So uh, it could yeah. be a really great way for, for you to kind of get something that maybe isn't on the menu or that they just got in. Um, that's kind of a, a good way to, to get in with them. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. I think just having the conversation is always nice. Um, you know, plus just chatting with people was always a lot of fun, getting to learn somebody new. And who knows, you may know somebody or know the connection to this person without even realizing it. It's just one, two, and you know that person. Yeah. Um, all right, the last two restaurant styles, let's do, like, first thing that comes to mind. Um, cocktail bar, what are you ordering? Boulevardier. Boulevardier. Or like we described earlier on the restaurant menu, uh, fine dining, looking through their their cocktail list, finding the spirit I want, finding something interesting about those spirits. Boom. That's it. Yeah. For me, it's dealer's choice. Like if they have a dealer's choice Ooh, option. That's um, always fun. You know, like a lot of the times with dealer's choice, they're going to be like, hey, what spirit do you want? Do you want it to be sweet? Like do you want it to fruity, be fruit forward? Like, do you want it to be you know, herbal? What do you want? Burr. You want and spirit forward, like just up, down, rocks. Let them run with it. If if it's yeah. not an option, I'm not going to be that guy to be like, what should, you know, dealer's choice. Dealer's choice. And the bartender's like, God damn it. You know, like, I, I don't fucking have time for this. But if it's on the menu, um, it means and they it, have time. It, it means they have time or their boss thinks they have time. Uh, so, <laughs> they've uh, got they've got at least a set dedicated cocktails that they all kind of think of when somebody tells right. you these four descriptions. Yeah. Um, and if it's not dealer's choice, it's going to be like a Negroni. Um, that's, that's kind of what I'm going for. Uh, I love and then that. last one, quick service. Yeah. So quick service kind of style restaurant I'm at right now that I'm running. Um, I always just look for something I recognize. Um, that's all I'll ever drink when I go to quick service. Um, most of the time I have trouble finding something that is super enjoyable if I try to reach out. Mm. Um, but if uh, there's something that the um, cashier, manager, whoever I'm chatting with to order my food um, is just like super gung-ho about, I'll try it. Cool. Yeah. I always give it a shot. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. You know, usually it's like a beer or, uh, you know, if they've got like a cocktail on draft or something, like I'll do that. Um, you know, canned cocktails are really cool at quick service restaurants. Um, so yeah, definitely something I'm familiar with, especially if it's in a city that I'm not, you know, I don't know. Um, or if their beer selections, like, you know, kind of, kind of lacking, I'll just be like, you got Nicola Balter, you got High Life, you got, you know, Scores Light, you got PBR, you uh, got something. You, you got something for me, so. Yeah, we've uh, got a Gruner on tap right now. That's my go-to. It's delicious. Like Hell yeah. Yeah. And like, and, uh, wines, like pegged wines are, have come a long way too. Um, you know, there's like Zinfandel pair, like goes really well on tap. Um, I've never had Gruner on tap, but I'm sure it's delicious. Uh, there's even yeah. like places that have Prosecco on tap, which makes a lot of sense because you already have CO2, uh, yeah. beer, so, um, why not? Um, it's actually interesting. Our concept, we use nitrogen only. So, uh, so it's all still wine, which is very fun. Cool. Hell yeah. Um, all right, let's jump into kind of some of our overseas travel and what we drank um, in our in our travels. Um, I know you went to France, uh, so tell me what you uh, what you were drinking in France when you went. Yeah, so uh, Alex and I went for Harvest in Burgundy. I think it was twenty twenty. Yeah, so yeah, right as the pandemic, which is or right before the pandemic, right before the pandemic, twenty nineteen. 2019. Yeah. Right before the pandemic. Um, that's where, uh, you know, we got to go see Matil who was at our wedding again. Um, and she kind of showed us around. She was our, um, just person that we were interacting with the whole time and, uh, let us stay with her family, which was awesome. Um, but we drank, you know, uh, Burgundy cause that's where she lives. Um, and so she kind of had her personal Pinot Noir Burgundy that their family made that they pour just, you know, open bottle after bottle for us. Just, hanging out, eating cheese and drinking, um, whatever they made for the most part. And then going out, it was very interesting because they order by the region and not by the producer, um, which I think has flipped when you come here into the States. I think people like look specifically for a producer only, not a region. Right. Um, and I think that's just kind of the style in which people make 
um, France versus here, you know, most places you have limitations on how you're supposed to make things or what you're allowed to make specifically. So um, I think it's easier for them just to choose a region or a, uh, whatever and just go with that without even looking at the producer. Um, and then we visited Champagne for a little bit and, of course, at Champagne. And then uh, went into France. Um, or excuse me, France, huh? Went into Paris for a second. We're in France the whole time. Uh, went into Paris for a half a second and um, just had a couple of um, just whatever wines were on the menu. I just let them order. It was just a blast. Um, but one specific interesting cocktail or wine mixture that they drink um, is called Cure. Um, and that is um, Aligote, which is one of the white grapes of Burgundy. Uh, there's only... Uh, two allowed technically. Um, and then um, uh, creme de cassis. And you just kind of mix the two together and uh, just makes it like a simple, uh, easy, sweeter style drinking of wine cocktail, you could say. And, you know, that's basically what we did in Burgundy. It was a blast, but. Um, in France, Burgundy in specific, it was a blast and uh, just had a good time and just enjoying whatever region kind of produces whatever is kind of the style in which we did. Oh, yeah. What about you in Italy? Yeah, um, you know, I spent a semester in Italy, so, uh, and I was 20, yeah, I was 20 when I was there. So for me, I was like, shit, this is the first time I can legally drink, and, like go to a bar. <laughs> um, so for me, like the main things, uh, cause we spent a lot of time at this local pub. It was like a, an English pub in Southern Italy. Uh, so, you know, they had a lot of like English beers, Belgian beers, things like that. Um, and my go-to, cause everything for some reason was five euros at this bar. Like it didn't matter what you ordered, everything was five euros. Um, and at the time, and kind of like how it is now, the euro and the dollar were, were basically one to one. So everything was five bucks. Um, so I would always get this beer called Gordon Platinum. Um, and it was a 12% ABV strong lager. So it was a, a light, a, a light lager. Like it, it drank like a lager, but it was 12% and it came in a 20 ounce can. Um, and it was damn. Bucks. So, you know, a couple of those and, you know, you're feeling pretty good. You're right? feeling great. Yeah, you're out 10 bucks and you, you've got a good buzz on because you've drank two 12% lagers. Uh, it's like it's drinking a I've, bottle of wine. Right there. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Um, and it, it's something that, I, uh, that I've, like, tried to find <laughs> in the States and they just don't import it, um, unfortunately. Probably too like, expensive and they make too little of it. Yeah. Um, when I went back to visit um, Olivia, because she was in Italy the, basically a, a year after me, and I went to go visit her, um, and I, I had a couple of those there, and I was like, man, I missed this, like, but you just can't get it here. Um, so I drank a lot of those. Um, we also had this bar, because, uh, again, we were all 20, 19, 21, like, you know, fresh, fresh drinking babies. <laughs> and uh, we would do what we called fire shots. And I still don't really know what all's in them, but I know like they would float absinthe on the top and then yeah, right. they would like, can make they fire. would light the fire. They would light the, uh, the absinthe on fire. And you'd essentially have to put your hand on the shot to, to put the fire out and it would suction to your hand and then you pull it off and you take the shot. Um, I, again, all I know is there was absinthe absinthe on top and a lot of the times because the bartender would be like drinking too and like there's a couple times where you know you would, you would run the absinthe along all the shots because we'd order them by like you know however many like that was our go-to so half the time you'd light the bar on fire and it was like it was like a wood top bar like a finished you know there's some sort of like a finish on the bar but you know like the absinthe would be all over and then you know you light one shot and you know, the whole bar would catch on fire and then you know put it out and uh, so Should we, be normal. Yeah, just a normal Tuesday. Um, so yeah, we would do like the, the fire shots, drink the Gordon Platinum, and stumble our way home because it was like uh, it was a really small town we were in. But I mean, the bar was on one side of the town, and our where we were staying was on the other side. So it was probably like a fifteen minute walk, not too bad. But you know, you're walking through uh, a really small town in southern Italy. Like the roads are all like. It's not paved like it is here. It's all stone roads. 
So like the roads are uneven, you know, the, the roads like don't really start and end. They just kind of flow. So you're like trying to stumble your way back through the town at, you know, two o'clock in the morning. And, uh, but you know, it was a, a small Southern town in Italy. So it was safe, you know, nothing ever happened, but, uh, it, it was a lot of fun. Um, and yeah. uh, my like wine journey, um, there is the last three weeks I was there. Uh, spent uh, uh, time at Tormoresco Winery, which is in Puglia, and there just kind of dove into wine and, you know, drank basically every lunch and dinner. They would open a bottle of wine for us, and, you know, we drank, you know, back vintages of Tormoresco wine. So uh, that was kind of like the main wine thing uh, that I had in Italy. So, um, a lot of that. yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, you want to talk a little bit about uh, time in California and New York? Uh, yeah, I'll just touch on it real quick. Like California, amazing. California has so many different regions, all the way north to all the way south. Um, and it's just got east to west, of course, as well. And like mountainous versus non-mountainous regions. You know, the I'd say the most popular region, most known region in the world uh, from California is Napa, probably followed by Sonoma. But, you know... Uh, Mendocino and um, I'm just blanking on all the, all the other regions because there's so many of them all kind of just, you know, popping up and creating certain really interesting wines, all, all different styles. Um, and kind of like what we touched about, you know, in France or in old world style wines, you know, you have to follow specific uh, wines that the region has required the winemakers to make. Where here in the new world, um, they can do whatever they want, however they want, whatever style they feel like doing, whatever grape, it doesn't matter. And you can and pull so whatever you want to as well. Like you can, yeah, give besides some... the few rules that there are across the world, right. like can't call it champagne. Well, in California, you can, but eh, it's California, a little bit. Uh, California yeah. champagne. Yeah. Get the yeah, whatever. They, they throw a little caveat in there California champagne yeah. and whatever. But. Brutal. <laughs> it is what it is. Um, but, you know, that's where, you know, I met my wife and it's just, you know, it has a special heart or a special place in my heart. And it's just uh, super amazing um, because of what they all offer. And um, literally everything and anything under the sun is there. Um, and literally under the sun is California. And I'm looking at that. I'm hitting my mic again. Here we go. Uh, uh, we haven't even started drinking, man. It's just coffee this morning. I know, it's um, coffee. That's it. Coffee and water. Coffee and water. All right. Soon. Soon we'll do those. Uh, uh, but, you know, it's just very cool. And you can just, you can spend years just studying California alone. And that doesn't include all of the other places in the United States that make wine. Um, another place like New York, which um, has just a whole variety of regions as well, all the way from um, the tip of uh, Long Island all the way up to the Finger Lakes of New York. Um, you know, it's got everything and anything as well. One of the cool things that I like about New York is the ice wine styles um, mm -hmm. from the Finger Lakes and those sweet wines that kind of Adam touched on earlier. It's just something special, something cool, very different in making wines and just a lot of fun for that. Um, but I don't know, you can go anywhere and everywhere in New York or in California and just find uh, the biggest, boldest, deepest, darkest reds all the way to the lightest, sweetest, most concentrated um, sweet wines. So yeah. they've got both regions all the way through. Yeah, my parents are from the Finger Lakes region of New York. So um, last time we were up there is for actually for my grandpa's uh, funeral celebration of life thing we uh, had an extra day and i was like hey i, I would love to go to a, a winery up here you know like it's where my parents yeah. are from and you know it, it's not something that like i can find where you know where i was from like they don't really they they weren't bringing a lot of new york wine to indiana and even here in georgia like it's just a lot of it stays in new york like it, it doesn't go very many places i mean certain places of course will we'll distribute but um, we ended up going to uh, Dr. Constantine Frank, which was cool Ooh. because I, I did a, a little project while we were in American Bounty on one of their wines, uh, their Arcat Satelli, uh, and I wore like a little cat mask in my presentation. Uh, but 
Um, you know, we did, uh, that's fun. we just sat outside. They had like a really like beautiful garden. They had like a food truck pop up. Uh, and we just did like a tasting. They make absolutely stunning sparkling wines. Um, they make them in the same style of champagne. So that secondary fermentation, secondary fermentation happens in the bottle. Uh, they make great Rieslings. They make great, uh, Bruners. They make great Gewürztraminer. Uh, their reds are nice. A lot of Cabernet Franc. Uh, their rosé is beautiful. Again, a rosé of Cabernet Franc um, that ages beautifully. Um, so yeah, like New York to me is like like I love New York wines um, and great values too because um, it's yeah. not you know New, uh, California a little bit harder to find value these days just because of how expensive like real estate is and, and vineyard spaces in California. Yeah, um, but I'd say like the less known regions there is where you can kind of find those deals. Yeah, like Dry Creek, there's still some really great good deals in Dry Creek. Napa, a little bit harder so to find much. good deals. Yeah, um, so everything's so expensive there. Now. So yeah, I know it's crazy. Um, you know, and everything's expensive everywhere now, but especially in California. Um, so yeah, like New York wine to me is, uh, you know, like that's that's clutch. Um, do you want to talk about, I know you're relatively new ish to North Carolina, uh, within the last, what, two years. Uh, yeah. do you want to touch on maybe some of your like favorite local breweries or, you know, favorite bar spots that you go to? Yeah. Um, so I kind of touched on earlier, um, resident culture. Um, that's a brewery here in uh, North Carolina. Um, I think started here and I'm pretty sure started here in Charlotte. Um, which is awesome, but their IPA is probably one of my favorite IPAs I've ever had. Um, it's probably the most uh, friendly first time IPA drinker uh, style, but also has a good complexity to it that uh, somebody who's drank a lot of IPAs can really enjoy. Um, and then, you know, there's just a lot of different small cocktail bars that I'm trying to really start to enjoy uh, one specific one, which is a very interesting style. It seems like it's a little bit of a thing here in North Carolina. Um, it's called dot, dot, dot. And they're just like a speakeasy style. Um, but a lot of these restaurant or speakeasy styles make you become a member mm. of what you could call. And you, it's like five bucks for the whole year to become a member. But you're like, I'm paying five bucks just to walk in the door. And they're like, yeah, no, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> And, and multiple, five bucks for a year is not too bad. There's a, a speakeasy here in Atlanta that's like, it's like a thousand bucks a year to be a member. What? Yeah. That's crazy. Well, they just want you to come in and I think makes them, makes it feel like it's a member's club. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm still diving into the restaurant beer world here in North Carolina, but there's a lot of great breweries throughout the whole state. Um, one of my favorite breweries um, um, of the whole state is called Wicked Weed. Um, and I'm pretty sure they were bought out by Anheuser-Busch. I believe that was the company that bought them out. Um, but they still get to represent themselves, which is great. It's just basically capital to them. Um, and they've been able to expand um, exponentially, which is awesome. They're uh, located in Asheville, North Carolina, and have this just stellar, uh, beautiful style brewery, where again, has some of the best food that we talked about earlier, and just like really chef driven food. But you know, you also have to have all of their, um, uh, their uh, beers, which is just fantastic. What about you over in Georgia? Yeah, I mean, Georgia, I haven't really dove into a whole lot. You know, I've been here about 10-ish months, 11 months-ish. And, um, <clears throat> you know, and, and with work and everything, I don't go out a whole lot. But um, I talked – yeah, it's terrible. I need, I need to quit my job and just hang out and go to breweries and record podcasts. Maybe one day. Maybe but, maybe yeah. One. But, um <laughs> It's, uh, you know, I touched on New Realm earlier, um, which is down kind of in like Atlanta-ish area. Um, and, uh, you know, their food's great. Their beers were fantastic. They took us on a little brewery tour um, and, you know, just kind of explained. Like, it was probably the cleanest brewery I've ever seen. This place was spotless. Um, and their beers were great. Another uh, local spot that I really like is called Six Bridges, which is in Johns Creek, which is like super close to where I live, maybe 10 minutes from my house. 
Um, super cool spot. Uh, their beer is great. They do a lot of canned cocktails as well. So they do like a, a ranch water. Um, they basically get in like um, you know, like a vat of um, like uh, agave. It's not even technically tequila. It's technically like an agave uh, distillate, I think is what it's called. And it's a... Uh, brought in at a super high proof and then they basically water it down um you know add things to it to make it more obviously palatable um but uh, when they get that in it's like it has something to do with like tax and liquor code um that they have to get it in like a higher higher proof and then bring it down uh and they also make like a, a vodka one which i think their last time i was there it was like a passion fruit pineapple um like vodka can carbonated cocktail um so yeah it's yeah, a great um they do everything from sours to stouts to lagers to um they were doing this really cool uh coriander and orange one which is similar to like a blue moon um that was really nice um so yeah that's kind of like my my go-to like breweries uh local bars you know i go wherever the high life is um i was really being surprised uh you know that that breweries down here carry high life because it's i you know it's very hit or miss um with places that'll carry it um i yeah. feel like a lot more places are, are carrying it now because it's like the the hipster like cool thing to drink um i i don't do it to be cool i do it because it's the best um and champagne of beers yeah and I'm, we're still i'm still waiting for a highlight they saw i tagged them in a post and they saw they saw it which to me i'm like oh shit they saw it uh All right. you never know I, hey you know we're still we're still up for up for sponsorship but um you hear, know, that high life? Yeah, hear that high life um uh, but yeah like, <laughs> I, I my go-to a lot of the time is, is high life um at whatever local bar i go to just because it's easy drinking and, you know it's it's it, it reminds me of a, a simpler time in life so um, yeah that's kind of what i'm what i'm into here in georgia um <clears throat> not you know haven't explored a whole lot i know there's a distillery down here um but i haven't been there so i, I don't want to you know talk too much about it but um yeah that's kind of that's kind of what i'm into here in uh, georgia i love it man you know everywhere you go there's always something to drink someplace yeah. to try something new to do Everywhere and that's one of the benefits. Everywhere you go, the drinks flow. Matt, yes, yes, chef, yes, chef, yes, chef. Uh, well, what do you say, Mason? You wanna, you wanna wrap this thing up? Yeah. All right, man. Thanks everybody for listening. Yeah, thanks for listening. Uh, this is, or this will be, episode twenty-five. Wherever the boys go, the drinks flow. Um, thank you to everyone who listened. Um, you know, our merch is still, um, yeah. Merch is uh, on sale on our website, www.assemblagebevco.com slash or forward slash collections to kind of see all of the merch. We've got t-shirts, we've got hoodies, we've got koozies, we've got magnets, beverage coasters, all sorts of good stuff. Um, check us out on Facebook and Instagram at Assemblage Bevco um, and listen to us, watch us on YouTube. Um, wherever you like to listen or watch your podcasts, uh, be sure to check us out. Um, until next time, I'm Adam. I'm Mason. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see you later. Thanks for listening, everyone. Peace.